it's uh, very much an honor to speak here and especially to be the first speaker of this series. It was March 19th of 2003. I was living in Fairhope, Alabama, and it was about time for the evening news to come on, and I always watch Channel 15, NBC Automobile. I turned it on, and the announcer said, we opened tonight's news with a breaking story out of Birmingham, Alabama. Massive accounting fraud uncovered at HealthSouth. It's estimated that there's almost $3 billion worth of bogus numbers on their books. At that moment, I realized that probably in the not-too-distant future, I would be in prison. How did it all begin? I first met Richard Scrushy in the summer of 1980. I was living in Houston, Texas, and I'd recently passed the CPA exam. And I actually majored in economics when I was in college, but after being out of school for more than 10 years, I had taken enough accounting and I qualified to sit for the exam and I passed it. And I, I had always worked for rather small companies and I wanted to go to work for a big company. I never worked with another CPA or had a boss who was a CPA. So I answered an ad in the Houston Chronicle for a controller position at the LifeMark Corporation, a publicly held hospital company uh, on the New York Stock Exchange there in Houston. And I went in for the interview, and the interview was with Richard Scrushy. And I knew immediately that I'd met somebody very different. All during the interview, my head was just spinning. He was such a salesman, and, and he just captivated you immediately. And by the end of the interview, I was totally convinced that that was the very best job I could have in Houston, Texas. But as I was driving home, I kept thinking about the guy, and by the time I got home, I told my wife that I thought I'd met the most brilliant businessman I would ever meet, or maybe the biggest con artist I would ever meet. Richard offered me the job, I reported to work, and I'd been at my desk for about five minutes. I just walked in the front door. And he came into my office and he said, Aaron, I'm presenting a contract to my boss. It's a contract I think we should sign. I'd like for you to sit in on my presentation. I said, sure, Richard. We went into his boss's office, he introduced me, and he said, Aaron and I worked on this contract for hours last night. I hadn't worked on anything. Today, after everything that's happened, I realize that in all probability he told that lie to size me up. He wanted to see how I would behave being included in a lie. I'm not a particularly confrontational kind of person, I just sort of dismissed it that he was trying to make me look good on my first day on the job. I worked for Richard for almost four years, and the first thing you learn about Richard Scrushy is that he has a big ego. I don't mean a big ego, I mean a really big ego. I'll put it this way, Donald Trump doesn't have an ego compared to Richard Scrushy. That's how big his ego is. We manage departments of hospitals, respiratory therapy, physical therapy, and pharmacy. Richard was a respiratory therapist, and I learned a lot from him. He was a good businessman, but uh, he, he told lots of white lies, and his ego was pretty oppressive. I came in one morning, and I picked up my Wall Street Journal, and the headline was, Life Mart merges with AMI, a much larger hospital company out of California. They said they'd be closing the offices in Houston, Texas. I thought, yeah, I'm going to be without a job. But what happens many times when large companies like this merge, and these were both New York Stock Exchange companies, venture capitalists will come around to see if someone has an idea for a startup company. Citicorp Venture Capital contacted Bill Mackey, the chairman of the board, and asked if there was such a person. And Mr. Mackey said, Richard Scrushy is your man. He's absolutely brilliant. And he's been, we made him a full vice president when he was only 26 years old. And he's been talking to us about doing more things on an outpatient basis. Back in the early 1980s, most health care was delivered through the acute care hospitals. If you were in an automobile accident and after your accident, your acute care state, you needed physical therapy 
your doctor just probably kept you in the hospital a little longer and you've received your therapy as an inpatient. But even in the early 1980s, the cost of health care was front page news. And everybody was trying to come up with ways to lower health care costs. Richard's concept was simple. Get people out of the hospital as soon as you can. Most expensive place in the world to spend a night is in an acute care hospital. If a patient doesn't need 24-hour nursing care, send him home and let him receive stuff like physical therapy as an outpatient. He convinced Citicorp to put a million dollars into a startup company to open a chain of outpatient rehab centers. Now Richard needed a management team, he wanted me to be a CFO, and I really was ready to get away from Richard. Like I said, his ego was oppressive, he lied a lot, but he's a good salesman. He said, Aaron, put in $5,000, you'll get 100,000 shares in the company, that's a nickel a share. He said, you got to realize Citicorp is paying a dollar a share for their million shares. So your $5,000 is already, already worth 100000 based on what they're paying. I knew Richard could build a big company. I had no doubt about that. And I liked the concept of a company that would lower health care costs. So I made the decision to go with Richard in his new company. Richard was from Birmingham, Alabama, so we moved to Birmingham, Alabama, we opened our first outpatient center, and we tried to make it look like a fitness center or a spa. We did not want the patient to feel like they were going back into a building full of sick people. We charged less than the acute care hospitals did, and it worked. Our first center made more money than we thought it would, it broke even sooner than we thought it would. And I knew early on in starting the company that I was on the ground floor of something pretty exciting. During this first year, we only had maybe 10 or 15 people in our corporate office. And I was usually the first person in every morning, but I, I came in one morning and Richard had gotten in before me and he had drawn this stick figure image of people pulling a wagon. And when everybody got there, he gave us a speech about, he said, these two guys are doing a pretty good job with the handle here, but he said, some of you guys are riding in the wagon, this guy's pulling it backwards, this guy's just kind of fat and dumb, not doing anything. <clears throat> and he didn't name anybody by name, but he, he left that drawing up in the lobby of our office, and it became the motto of the company, pull the wagon. And as the years went by, he had that exact drawing framed and it hung in the lobby of every Health South facility next to a picture of himself. <laughs> At the end of the year, if you were an outstanding employee, you got 100 shares of stock and you, you got a little red wagon. It was called a Pulling the Wagon Award. When I wrote my first book about Health South, I was trying to come up with a title, and my wife gave me the title. She said, just call it Health South, The Wagon to Disaster. <laughs> As we started opening these outpatient centers, we noticed that there was a need for rehabilitation hospitals, specialty hospitals. At the time, there were only 56 in the United States, so we got into that business. Within a few years, we noticed that outpatient surgery was starting to be a business. Years ago, like when I was a little boy, a physician would not cut on you in any way unless you were inside of an acute care hospital. Today, 60% of all surgeries are done outpatient. They cut on you that day, and you go home that day. So we got into that business. So we were really on the forefront of these kind of alternative delivery systems, uh, outpatient rehab, outpatient surgery, those types of things. Within two years, we were talking to investment bankers about going public. And I think we had the most important meeting in the history of the company when we were talking to some of these bankers about uh, going public process. The bankers were from a firm called Drexel Burnham. And they flew down to Birmingham to meet with Richard Dine. The banker, <coughs> he said, look, I like your concept. Your business plan looks good. Um, your facility is terrific. He said, but you're not making money yet. You're still a startup company. You're losing money. He said, we can't register your stock and take you public until we know you can make money in this business. He said, you're opening a lot of centers, and you tell me they lose a little money for a while. He said, how are you accounting for that? And I said, well, we're expensing our startup costs. 
And he looked at us and he almost had a twinkle in his eye and he said, no, no, no. Capitalize those costs. Put them on the balance sheet and write them off over several years. He said, if you do, I think you're going to make a profit much sooner and we'll take you public. <coughs> Richard went crazy. Aaron, Aaron, why are you letting the accounting tell wag the dog? I'm out here killing myself trying to get this company public and your silly accounting is hurting us. I'm embarrassed that this man had to fly down here from New York City and explain something so simple to you. He said, let me tell you how it's going to be. As the CFO of this company, you will always do what helps the bottom line and don't ever forget that. I ran the concept by our auditors. They said it was okay, but they warned me that it could be abused. And of course, we abused the hell out of it. So starting day one, HealthSouth was probably putting things on its balance sheet that should have stayed on the P&L. But shortly thereafter, maybe three months, six months, we were showing a profit and we registered to go public. We registered to sell two million shares tentatively priced at eight to ten dollars a share. And the way the process works is you register with the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and then you go on a road show while they're approving your deal. You go to New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., all of the financial centers. The final road show is always in New York City. <clears throat> That's the night before your stock starts trading, before they actually price the stock. Richard made the presentation, and when he finished, he got a standing ovation. And the investor sitting next to me was shaking his head. He said, I I I've never seen anything like this. He said, normally people don't applaud on road shows. And he says, all my years on Wall Street, I've never seen anybody get a standing ovation. He said, you guys should not be going public. Your company is only two years old. Your audited top line is only $5 million. You and Richard have no track record that you can run a public company. He said, you're going to get the deal done because Richard Scrushy is the best salesman ever heard on a road show. We did get the deal done, not at eight to ten dollars a share, but six fifty, which tells you it was kind of a weak deal, but we got it done. Within a few months we were about a twenty dollar stock. You can do the arithmetic, I have a hundred thousand shares. I'd gotten options for another fifty thousand during the two startup years. Before this I never had a net worth of more than a hundred thousand dollars. Now I had a liquid stock well worth more than, you know, almost two million dollars. It sort of changed me. As soon as I could, I sold a little stock and went out and paid cash for a Mercedes. Never driven a Mercedes before. As the years went by and the stock did well, I built about a 10,000 square foot home in Birmingham. I bought a condo in the French Quarter. I had three beach houses in Florida. Every year I bought a new Porsche, BMW, Lexus, whatever kind of car I wanted. And I took a real liking to these neckties that all the investment bankers wore. And I saw them every time I went to New York City. So I bought about $30,000 worth of them. They're really good looking ties. <laughs> now, the newfound wealth really changed Richard Scrooge. I did not realize it, but he had always wanted to be a rock and roll star. So he formed a band called Proxy. And he began playing in nightclubs and at company events and music festivals like City Stages up in Birmingham. And he wasn't that good of a singer and the band didn't take off like he thought it should. So he had the theory, because country music was coming big, he went to Nashville and he bought himself a cowboy hat and he hired people from Sawyer Brown and the Oak Ridge Boys to back him. He produced an album and he wrote a song called Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. And he sent out memos nationwide to all of our employees telling them to call their radio station and have them play Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. He also started always carrying a gun in his briefcase. And as the years went by, he hired bodyguards that would follow him everywhere. If he went into Walmart at night, there'd be a couple of goons talking to their sleeves as he shopped at Walmart. But in spite of these things, he was a darling of Wall Street. Six other companies went public doing essentially the same thing we did. 
Richard Scrushy was given credit for creating an entire new niche for people to invest in. People wanted Richard Scrushy on the board of directors. <clears throat> Within a few years, he was appointed to the board of trustees of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. So, in spite of these kind of quirky things, he, he was a darling of Wall Street. Now that there were six companies doing essentially the same thing we were doing, we started buying them up. We would actually trade our stock for their stock. We didn't even have to come up with cash because our stock always had a higher price. So we started doing billion dollar transactions. Keep in mind we started the company in 84. We went public in 86. By 1995, we were the largest company in the state of Alabama. We were operating in all 50 states. We had 60,000 employees. We owned more rehab hospitals, more outpatient centers, and more outpatient surgery centers than any other company. And we had grown to be the 250th in the 500 largest companies in the United States. I was a rock star in Birmingham. I could go into any restaurant, people would want to point me out, they would want to come up and shake my hand, buy me a drink. I always thought it kind of odd when you're rich, people want to buy you things. <laughs> we started buying jet airplanes. At one point, we owned 14 jets, two Gulf Streams, which are $30 million airplanes. Richard learned to fly all of the planes. This kind of sounds like a pretty good success story of what went wrong. One word, really, and that word is greed. We were very greedy. It was so much fun being wealthy and having the prestige of flying around in private planes and things. And we lost our focus as far as morals and ethics went. It was all about making the stock go up because we had lots of stock options. Now, for Richard, it was a huge deal. He told the Birmingham newspaper in 1994, that he wanted to be the richest man in the state of Alabama. He hoped he could become a billionaire. And I estimated in 1995 that his, from his public holdings that he was worth $600 million. In 1997, he was the highest paid executive in the United States. He took home $110 million in that one year. Now here's what he would do. He would meet with a stock analyst with the investment banking firm ever so often, two or three times a year, and he would ask them, what do we need to earn next year for you to keep a strong buy on our stock? And they would tell him. And he would say, we can do that. Not a problem. It didn't matter what our internal projections really said we were going to do. Richard just simply promised that we could deliver what they wanted. It wasn't really a problem the first two, three, four years. HealthSouth was a very good company. We were making a lot of money. Our basic business strategy was to align ourselves with the best orthopedic surgeons in the United States. In Birmingham, Dr. Jim Andrews practiced at our hospital. He now practices in, in Gulf Breeze. He is the renowned orthopedic surgeon in the United States. He did Bo Jackson's hip, Troy Aikman's shoulder. He is the physician when Drew Brees couldn't get a job because they thought he was impaired. He told the Saints Drew Brees could still throw the ball and he took him to a Super Bowl. So we were a good company, but it became more and more difficult to deliver those numbers. So we started doing some things. You know, there's probably a few accounting majors in here, but we started. Uh, in the area of accounting, your trickiest area is what's called revenue recognition, how you book your revenue. And in healthcare, it's very tricky because you have discounts with HMOs, Medicare, Medicaid, you have lots of bad debts. So you have to estimate how much money you think you're going to collect. And this was like a cookie jar for Richard. Oh, we can just estimate this stuff. <laughs> so we started lowering our bad debt expense and doing things that weren't really good accounting. I didn't feel like it was fraudulent because we did disclose it. We told the analysts, we told the SEC what we were doing. Was it good accounting? No. For you accounting majors, you understand this. You don't run your numbers and say, boy, these numbers stink. 
Let's change the way we do our accounting. That's not good accounting, but that's what we were doing. In the summer of 1996, after being a public company for 10 years and never missing our numbers, we had missed them very badly. Bill Owens, my chief accountant, and I felt like we couldn't play around with the numbers anymore. Wall Street and the investors were starting to scratch their head. Our cash flow didn't seem right. Our days in AR were growing. So we felt like we had to report true numbers. We couldn't just play with them anymore. It was becoming obvious we were doing it. We went into Richard's office to tell him about it, and I knew it was going to be like telling him that he couldn't see. But we went in, and we laid it out, and we said, Richard, we've just got to report numbers below street expectations. Get out of my office! Have you guys lost your minds? This is not an option. We are not going to report a bad quarter. Here's the problem. You've gotten lazy. You guys are smart. Get back into your office and fix these numbers. You've done it before. Then he put on his salesman hat and he said, look, health care is the biggest business in the United States by far. We're barely in the acute care hospital business. We can get into that in a big way and become one of the largest companies in this country. But we can't do it if our stock crashes and people sue us. And he almost got on his knees and he says, guys, there's got to be something you can do. Bill Owens, who had worked for our auditors, said, look, and it's just Richard, Bill, and myself. He says, I can make entries small enough, because he had worked for our auditors, and I know what their thresholds are to examine entries, and I will make entries small enough that they'll never look at them, and I will get the numbers to where they need to be. And he was very plain about it. He said, now, guys, I will be crediting revenue we didn't generate, and I'll be debiting assets we do not have. Richard thought about it just for a second. He said, guys, this is our best option. We'll only do it this one time. Employees won't lose their jobs. Stockholders won't get hurt. And you guys know everybody does this kind of thing. At that point, I should have had the courage to stand up to Richard and say no. But I stand before you today telling you I was a coward. I was intimidated by Richard. I did not want to cause his net worth to go down by several hundred million dollars. I knew he had a gun in his briefcase. <laughs> and there was a part of me that did not want the party to end. It was fun being rich. And I knew I would have to be the one to explain to the stock analysts why we missed our numbers. So that night, I let Bill Owens cook the books. The next day when I came into work, I felt like people were staring at me. I felt like I had blood on my hands. I didn't really understand what crossing that line would do to me emotionally and mentally. And from that day forward, I was pretty much a train wreck. We did it again the next quarter. 1996 ended. The auditors did not detect the fraud. Bill Owens was a very clever accountant. 1997 was beginning, and we pled with Richard, tell Wall Street we're going to have a down year. We're in a hole. We're not even where they think we're at. He would have no part of it. He promised Wall Street another record year that I believe we couldn't possibly achieve. At the end of the first quarter, we'd missed the numbers again. By now, about seven people were involved in the fraud. We had our meeting with Richard, and we decided to do it again. And at the end of the meeting, Richard made eye contact with every one of us. He said, if we're ever caught, I'm going to deny everything. I don't know what your plan is, but I will deny everything. By now, I was on a rapid pace to becoming an alcoholic. I hated coming to work. For the first time in my life, I felt trapped. And I didn't want to be the whistleblower. Because I knew what Richard would do. He'd bring more lawyers, guns, and money to the party than I would. So I made the decision to retire. 
I went to Richard and I said, look, I've made enough money, I just want to retire. We didn't talk about the fraud. He's very smart. You don't have to spell it out for him. So in September of 1997, I left the company and I moved to Fairhope, Alabama. And right next to the Fish River, close to uh, the old Lulu's, if you know where that is, next to <coughs> Dominion Farms. And I bought 25 acres of land and I built a very big house and I built a barn and a tennis court and a swimming pool and a, a stage for bands to play on. And for some reason, I built a football field in my backyard. I'm not sure why I did that, but I did. About a year after I'd been retired, I got a phone call from Richard. And he said, come to Birmingham, have lunch with me. He said, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. And I drove up to Birmingham and had a lunch with him in his private dining room with his private chef. And he said, Aaron, come back to work. He said, we're making our numbers fine now. He said, I want you back on the team. And I told him no. And I drove the 200 miles or so back to, to Fairhope. 1998 passed, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. But as, as I opened my talk today in the spring of 03, I heard that announcer say, massive accounting fraud in HealthSouth. I might have just sort of passed out then. When I first retired, every time my doorbell rang or the phone rang, I thought it was the FBI. But so much time had passed, and of course I truly wanted to believe Richard. And enough time had passed that I thought, surely they, they're not still cooking the books. And I wasn't looking over my shoulder so much. But I knew I was in big trouble. The next day in the newspaper, Alice Martin, the attorney with the federal government, said that several people had come forward, but we know of other people who were involved in the fraud and they should come forward. And I thought her next sentence was going to be, Aaron B., give us a call. <laughs> I started checking around to hire an attorney and a fellow in Mobile named Donald Brussman, who some of y'all may know, um, a very good criminal attorney. And I talked to him on the phone. I told him my situation. He said, okay, Mr. Bean, let me call the feds in Birmingham. I'll call you back before the end of the day. Within about two hours, he called back. He said, oh, yeah, Mr. Bean, they want to talk to you. He said, you need to be in my office at 8 o'clock in the morning. So Phyllis and I drove to downtown Mobile. And first thing he said was, do not lie to me. Do not lie to the federal government. Your former employees have told them you were involved. <coughs> the FBI has seized the Health South building. If you try to lie your way out of this, you will go to prison for a long time. 